Good day, everyone. Um, today, we're going to be talking about coronary artery disease and specifically about how lifestyle medicine can be used to prevent and treat it. I have no disclosures at the current time. And we're going to talk about a couple of different sections. First is going to be the background of lifestyle medicine, then the effect of diet, then exercise, and finally, a, a big growing area, which is stress and uh, how it relates to lifestyle and also heart disease. Learning objectives, we're going to learn the impact of lifestyle on coronary artery disease. Um, just talk about some very simple dietary habits that impact coronary artery disease and learn about how little exercise you really need to affect overall health and realize how damaging stress is to your heart. All right. First, the background of lifestyle medicine. All right. So in medicine, we get to choose two pathways. One is we can be really healthy or we can be medicated healthy. So if you're the person on the left side of the screen, diet, exercise, low stress, you don't need a lot of medication. In America, I can uh, take care of your blood pressure, your diabetes, your high cholesterol with a ton of medications, but you still have high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol. So we're just kind of managing it. We're not really getting rid of the problem. That's one of the big factors here. Now, one of the big choices people have to make is you want to take the easy way. And the easy way, mostly, oh, the easy way is give me a pill for this. Can you put in a stent? I don't want to change my lifestyle. But really, the hard way is what we do which is do invasive surgeries like stents or bypass surgery, um, which is much more difficult than changing your lifestyle, much harder on the patient. So I got interested in lifestyle medicine because I'm a cardiologist, but I used to be on Lipitor for cholesterol and Norvas for high blood pressure. Um, and I got off all that stuff because what had happened is over time after college and med school and getting married and work and having two kids, I basically had gained 45 pounds never exercise, ate terrible, slept very little, a lot of stress. So I started eating um, better. This is a picture of me to begin with here. This is a picture of me probably eight years ago. Um, and I started eating better, exercising. I eventually got off my medications and I'm a big runner now. And a dramatic difference in how I look, feel, um, and how and my health level. I don't know if you've ever seen this article in Time Magazine, but a lot of people think that lifestyle is not effective because your genes or your genetics are so important. So this is a great quote from the article. It says, genetics loads the gun, but behavior pulls the trigger. You may have a lot of genes that make you higher risk for heart disease, stroke, or um, even cancer, but what you eat, what you, how much you exercise, those factors are much more important in um, having a head diseases. And the, this is a great example. So here we have a skinny kid, and a lot of the lifestyle medicine stuff is based on losing weight, but this is an example of gaining weight. But this is the same kid. Now, did his gene program change? They had different DNA? No. What happens, he started exercising, eating more protein, taking care of himself, and he actually grew muscles. He made his genes make more, pro, uh, more um, RNA to code for more protein and make you more muscle. So you can go either way. You can get bigger, stronger, or you can get skinnier, but it can be done here. Now there's a really interesting study called um, the Fit Fat Twin Study. Now in Finland, they have 100% genetic data on everyone born there. So they know everyone's DNA. So they found people that were identical twins and one twin liked exercise and one twin did not like exercise. And they followed them. So it's a small study, just 10, 10 pairs of twins. Um, but what they found out that in three years time, the twin that liked exercise actually had less body fat, which makes sense. He also had better glu glucose metabolism. So he's not less likely to be diabetic. But more importantly, when they looked at the kids' MRA, MRIs of their brain, they had larger brains. The people that exercised had metabolic changes, physiologic changes, but had structural changes in their brain, which is pretty impressive. Now in America, there's many different things that define what a healthy person is. And we're going to talk about it just real quickly and look at the numbers. 
if you look over here, if you don't smoke, your body mass index is the ratio of your height to weight. If you're physically active, have a good diet score, and your cholesterol, blood pressure, and glucose, blood sugar all controlled, that's what we call ideal health. Um, now, you think a lot of people would be healthy, but when you look at the studies, the amount of people that have all seven metrics healthy are less than 1%. So a lot of people are really unhealthy or at least have a couple things to work on um, to get even more healthy. Now, there, there's a Framingham risk score where you can look at things like age, smoking status, blood pressure, and cholesterol, and they'll give you a risk. There's some newer models that take into lifestyle factors. I'm going to show this real quickly. So you can score yourself by if you smoke, how much you drink, if you have a good diet, how active you are, but also how much do you sleep and how much sedentary or sitting behavior you have. And if you put that all together and you give yourself kind of a score here, it can tell you what your risk of death is over the next 10 years. So lifestyle has a, it's a really powerful way to determine what your risks are for developing or dying from heart disease. Now, this is a great study called the InterHeart Study. And what they did is they looked at, um, I think it was like 50 or 60,000 people that had a heart attack and another group that did not. And they looked at differences. And what they found is that half the risk of having a heart attack was based over here in lifestyle factors. What did you eat? How much you exercise? Um, did you smoke, et cetera? Now, it's really interesting is if you look at all the other factors they looked at, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, stress, cholesterol, when they took all the risk factors, they could figure out over 90% of your risk just by um, these clinical factors. So things like CT scans, echoes, CAFs were not involved in the study. It was just kind of just real simple labs and a real simple biometric measurements. And you could get about 90% of the risk profile. Now this is, oh, let me go back. This is important. So some people say lifestyle medicine is not effective. You just have to give them the pills. So there's a study looking at the, the relative difference between um, lifestyle treatments and common medications that we use. So if you look here, smoking cessation, physical activity, alcohol consumption, and dietary changes have a huge impact on lowering your risk for heart disease. Now, if you look at common medications that I use all the time, low-dose aspirin, statins, beta blocks, ACE inhibitors, they're similar in effect. So lifestyle changes are hugely important. They're really cheap, can be used anywhere, and that's really a big focus now because of the worldwide um, obesity epidemic. Okay. Now, another thing the American Heart Association has done, or the AHA in America, they try to make it simple, and their program is called Healthy, if I can see this, Healthy for Good. And they have four things they want people to focus on. And I'm gonna hit those real quickly for the rest of the talk. Um, one is eat smart, two is add color, Three, move more. Four, be well or be less stressed. So the first thing is eating well. And I like to say, take the diet out of diet. In America, people are always going on new diets, trying to lose weight. And they're usually very restrictive. You can't eat this or that. And very hard to um, follow, very hard to do. Got to eat smart. So everything is based on choices you make. You can choose unhealthy foods and get the consequences or eat healthy foods and get the good consequences. And this is something I like to have people think about, is basically you shape your own destiny with every choice you make. Um, I did that, if you have years of eating bad, not exercising, you get unhealthy. If you make little choices every day to walk more, eat better, that eventually is gonna make you more healthy. All right, treatment versus prevention here. Now. If you look, and this is probably somewhere around the world, I'm a cardiologist, so I work at this little group at the top that have had heart attacks, stroke, et cetera. The problem is the majority or 90% of the population is down here, and we're kind of ignoring them because we do a lot of sick care. What we really need to do is try to be more preventive and do more wellness care. And this is a review article talking about the interventions and the impact. If you look over here, heart failure, low ejection fraction, very small part of the population. 
And these are things we can do, cardiac transplantation, defibrillators, heart caps, all those things have a very small population impact. Now, if you look at attacking the obese, overweight people, which is now about half the United States and probably about half the world now, weight loss, plus everything else, you have a huge impact on population health. And that's why we have to really focus on that. This is gonna be the biggest bang for the buck. All right, now it's interesting, this study just came out in Lancet, I think about a week ago. A bad diet kills more people now than smoking or hypertension. And there's a couple of things they looked at here in this study. Um, and what they focused on was about 15 different dietary factors, but too much sodium and actually low, not eating enough whole grains, low consumption of fruits, low nuts, low vegetables, low omega-3, low fiber, low beans were really, really hurting us. There's some other benefit we can get by having, you know, working on less trans fats, calcium, this is soda pop, sweetened beverages, processed meat, and then high um, red meat. But the bigger bang for the buck is up here, and most is reducing sodium intake, more whole grains, more fruits and veggies, more nuts, uh, which is really common. It's all, that's all just what you eat, that's all just your diet. Now this is a great resource. If you Google Harvard Healthy Plate, this thing has been put together based on data, not by um, lobby groups. But basically, if you have a meal, about half your plate should be fruits and veggies, a quarter, some kind of whole grain, and then a healthy protein does not have to always be um, animal protein, but beans are great, nuts are great, etc. cetera. Um, the other thing is just drinking water is probably the best thing for you. There's a huge problem in America and also the rest of the world where drinking soda um, is a huge cause of probably the diabetes type two epidemic and then also the obesity epidemic. All right. One of the things they talk about in the AHA or American Heart Association um, recommendation is add color. And that usually means adding different colored fruits and vegetables to your diet to make it better, not adding candies, um, et cetera. Now, this is a great um, graph looking at what the size of a serving is, but there's new information where eating up to 10 servings of fruits and veggies a day is actually still helpful. You still get more benefit as you eat more. So you can keep pushing. So that's like three servings of fruits and veggies per meal plus one snack. So a lot of room for improved and increased fruits and veggies. The one color that is really bad though is white and that's processed refined sugar. So I'm gonna show some sugar data here real quickly. This is a really interesting study where they had a functional MRI and they gave people sugar and the pleasure centers of the brain lit up. Now, when you gave these people cocaine, the same pleasure centers lit up. Sugar is really addictive. Sugar is sweet, everyone likes sugar, but it's a big problem. This is a really interesting study done by the American Heart Association. And they looked at, they did a model and they figured out how much extra death was due just by soda. Now, Mexico had the most, United States is number four, but you can tell that soda pop has a definite impact on the deaths of uh, people just around the world. And that's because it's highly refined sugar, um, sugar you don't need, excess calories, et cetera. All right, Move, moving more. All right, so a lot of people want to get in really good shape. Um, and that's one of the motivations for exercising. The best motivation actually to get healthy. And so if people want to get like an instant six pack, um, like these guys do. All right. In, in your mind, I want you to think, what is the minimum amount of exercise you need to decrease your mortality? All right. And this is a great study that looked at that. And what they found basically is that at about 15 minutes of time, the survival curves start to separate. So if you walk continuously for 15 minutes a day, at that point, you start to decrease your mortality rate for heart disease. Now, the great thing is, if you do a little more vigorous exercise, is actually you have that, that curve gets moving even farther left. So you need very little exercise to make a difference. The latest data is five minutes of continuous exercise is enough to show a difference, but more is better and we'll look at some of the data later as well. So this is a huge um, meta-analysis 
is 391 studies put together looking at how effective exercise is. And what they found is any exercise, weight training, um, cardiovascular like jogging, or the combination is really good for blood pressure. And in fact, basically any type of exercise is equal to about one blood pressure medication. So very effective, really cheap, um, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit, has a huge impact on well-being and mood. All right. So I'm a big runner, I love running, but these are some, uh, this is a meta-analysis of the impact of running. And what they found is basically runners live three more years longer, so decreased mortality. Every hour of running adds about seven hours to the back end of your life, which is awesome. Finally, every hour or every 21 minutes of TV takes about, a, um, I'm sorry, every hour of TV you watch will cut your life down by about 21 minutes. So, and this is a big problem because people love to watch movies, be on um, social media, et cetera. Um, and also resistance training, even though I'm a big runner, resistance training is probably the most effective way to exercise. All right. The last kind of section we're gonna talk about is um, relaxing and being stressed and de-stressing. And this is about being well. So running is really good for many things. Um, mood, sleeping better, health, but also it de-stresses you. Something about pushing weights or running hard really kind of decreases the stress in your mind. Now, this is a great study, but before I talk about this, um, when people in research studies measure stress, they don't measure it by blood pressure response, heart rate response, galvanic skin response. They measure it by asking the person, are you stressed or not stressed? It's just that simple. So here's a study where they had the hypothesis that stress turns on your amygdala, which is the midbrain, and that's kind of the reptilian reflexive part of your brain. That will send precursors, activate your bone marrow to send out inflammatory cells and eventually those inflammatory cells will damage the lining of your arteries and that will lead to heart attack, stroke, et cetera. And so they actually kind of proved that pretty well. First graph here, they talked about people that said they were low stress actually had low amygdalar activity. High stress people had high activity and they had more event rates, worse survival curve. Same thing here. Um, same, same thing as this is down here. Now, this is a great example here. This is on the left is a person that has low stress. And so the amygdala is not turned on on this PET scan. The bone marrow is not, the aorta is not inflamed and the bone marrow is not turned on. This is a person who says, I have high stress. The amygdala is turned on. The aorta is picking up inflammatory markers and the bone marrow is highly activated. So there's another way to look at this quantitatively. The more your perceived stresses, the more amygdala activation you have. All right. The more you say you're stressed, the more inflammation they can find in your aorta. And finally, CRP, which is a blood test that measures global inflammation, the more you say you're stressed, the higher your CRP level. So this all worked perfectly well in this study. Also getting angry, can people say, don't keep it in, let it all out. Um, but a lot of times the bursts of anger actually set you up to have a cardiovascular event. So this is a meta-analysis and they looked at myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, aneurysm rupture, or ventricular arrhythmias, or really lethal heart rates. And what they found is that your um, odds ratio of having any of these events goes dramatically up if you have an angry outburst. So when you get mad at your kid, you get mad at your coworker, get mad at watching the news, all these things happen. And the crazy thing is you're still at risk for about two hours after the event. So you snap, you get mad. For the next two hours, you're gonna be at increased risk of, um, of having a stroke, heart attack, or ventricular arrhythmia. Now the flip side, this is very interesting. They've actually studied vascular function based on your mood. So I don't know if you've seen this, but something about Mary, and this is a real study, is a comedy. And then Saving Private Ryan is a very serious war movie. And what they did is they looked at um, brachial artery flow 
in people after, before and after watching a comedy and laughing and before and after watching a serious war movie and see what happened here. So what you can see here is people that watch the comedy, this is their baseline level and after laughter, the amount of blood that goes through their brachial artery actually increased. Before and after watching a movie with, that was stressful, like Saving Pirate Ryan, it actually got worse. So even your mood, the way you feel, will affect your blood vessels. So stress raises blood pressure, puts more stress in your heart. All these things are true. All right. Now, there's this really um, interesting study in Lancet that just came out um, late last year. And it looked at 1.2 million people, but it looked at amount of physical exercise and mental health. And it found a couple of interesting things. One is, if you look at this, this is the reduction in days per month of having a bad day. And people that exercise had significant reduction in bad days. And that reduction actually kind of depended also on what sport you did. All right, this is household chores here, but popular sports, cycling, aerobics, running and jogging, recreational sports, winter water, or just walking, they all had a big impact on lowering the number of bad days that you had. And they're looking at all the data here. Just focus on the left for all exercise. And what they found is that probably doing about 45 minutes a day is where um, people had the biggest benefit in decreasing the amount of bad days per month. And that was pretty consistent on most of the sports. Also, they found out that you probably have to do it about five times a week. And that was probably the biggest reduction in having um, stress and having bad days is basically doing five times of exercise. So what we would kind of recommend, we recommend six days a week. If you miss a couple, that's fine. All right. Now this is important. This, and this is why we give these kind of health talks is this is a social map done by the public school at Harvard and every yellow dot is an obese person. And what you find is that obese people cluster together, but so do healthy people. And in this study, they found that there's a big impact where even three or four people away from you can still negatively affect your health. So that's like if someone brings you know, unhealthy food in for free, then everyone starts eating that, that has a negative impact on you. You might not even know that person or like that person. The other thing, though, is that we can positively impact. If we bring in healthy food, say, hey, let's go for a walk after work, um, you know, try to de-stress and support each other. There's are ways that we can actually socially make everyone more healthy. And this is um, important, not just for your work, maybe your church, but especially think about your family unit. It's not just your own health, but you're affecting the health of everyone that's near you. And that's really important here. The, the last thing I want to talk about um, is the role of lifestyle medicine in cancer. I know this is more of a cardiovascular talk, but if you look at this middle column here, this is the percent reduction in all sorts of breast cancer. Grabbing all sorts of cancers, including breast, prostate, especially colon. Basically, um, eating fiber is enough to drop your colon cancer risk in half. And this is lung. This is not including smoking. So if you don't smoke and have a healthy lifestyle, your chance of lung cancer goes down even more. And this is the raw number of cases that we could avoid um, if we really had optimal diet and lifestyle. Okay, so kind of the summary here, to, to um, finish off here, the secret to living longer and well is you want to eat half of what you eat, eat healthy, walk double, be more active, laugh triple, have a good attitude, and love without measure. So just to kind of recap what we kind of talked about here. Eat smarter, more fruits and veggies, um, nuts, beans, works, Add more color, fruits and veggies, and avoid white, which is refined sugar. Move more. Remember, you just have to move about 15 minutes a day to make a difference in mortality. But obviously, obviously the more, the better. So the more active you are. And it can just be walking. It does not have to be even jogging. Finally, be well de-stress. We didn't talk about this, but sleep is really important. Um, but... Remember, the measure of stress was perceived stress. If you feel you're stressed, that's enough to make things go bad for you. You need to think positive, try to de-stress your situation, 
and that has a whole bunch of vascular effects for you. All right. And finally, good luck. All right. Thank you for your attention.